Chapter 4, Stranded. The ocean carried the rafts, rafts as if they were cars on a roller coaster, 12 feet up to the crest of a swell, 12 feet down to the base of a trough. The men strained at the ropes that bound the rafts together and huddled in tight formation. They bobbed on the, on the waves, packed like sardines, marinating in salt water. Blood had begun to dry in a brown crust across Ronald's face. Bartek was still bleeding from his hand. Adamson could barely move in the corner of his raft. And yet they were alive. For the moment, nothing else mattered. As the plane headed for its meeting with the ocean, each member of the crew had lived with the probability that he would be dead in a few minutes. But here they were, still breathing the air, and that was enough to fill each of them with pure joy. The simple fact of survival made the world look hopeful. And then the retching began. As the churning of the current took its toll, sea sickness set in. One by one, the men joined Alex at the sides of the rafts, vomiting into the water. Rickenbacker claimed he felt fine. But Whitaker was sure he saw three heads, not just two, bent over the side of the colonel's raft. Whitaker was enjoying a moment of relief when a sudden movement in the water caught his eye. Since they landed, he'd been focused on either the plane in, his dis in the distance or the raft beneath him. Now he scanned the water around them, and what he saw made him recoil in terror. The ocean was not as lonely as he had thought. Everywhere he looked, triangular fins sliced the surface, sharks, long, sleek, and silent, surrounding the rafts. When a wave crested just right, Whitaker got a good look at them. They were gray on top, white on bottom. Some were at least 10 or 12 feet long, even longer than the rafts. They circled the group like vultures waiting for an easy victim. It was suddenly clear to Whitaker just how vulnerable he and the rest of the crew were. If the sharks decided to attack, the rafts would give way in a second. The rubberized canvas was tough, but it was no match for a set of shark teeth. One good bite and the men would have more holes to patch than they could manage. Even fully inflated, inflated the rafts were barely a protection at all. The side tubes were a little more than a foot tall and a foot wide. The two-person raft was so small that DeAngelis and Alex had trouble keeping their elbows from dangling over the side. The men pulled their limbs in tight and kept a weary eye on the waters around them. The predator seemed willing to keep their distance, for now. As their stomachs settled, the men regrouped to discuss their prospects. Still flush with adrenaline from the narrow escape, everyone felt sure they would be home soon. The occasional seabird swooped and squawked in the sky overhead. They all agreed that gulls didn't stay stray far from land. There had to be an island nearby. Besides, they had been in contact with Canton till the very end. The radio operator there had assured them that the planes had already been sent to look for them. Then there was the SOS signal Reynolds had banged out until the very last moment. Rickenbacker insisted that someone must have heard it and gotten a read on their position. Young Johnny Bartek, for one, was convinced it wouldn't be more than three days before they were rescued. If they were nothing but no-name enlisted troops, they'd be on their own, he thought. But they had the VIP of all VIPs with them. The generals would send the whole army out to look for Rickenbacker. A stream of planes would be dispatched from California to Hawaii, Hawaii to Canton. From there, the rescue parties would fan out over the ocean, spotters peering out the windows. The tops of the rafts were painted bright yellow to make them stand out against the waves. Before long, they would all be sitting under palm trees somewhere, sipping pineapple juice and trading stories about the ordeal. Bartek could get home to his grieving family. In fact, with any luck, they'd be off the rafts before sundown. That way, they wouldn't have to spend a night at sea. In the meantime, they took stock of their supplies. Before they ditched, DeAngelis had gone through all the parachutes on the plane and stripped them of anything useful. The hull consisted of several fish hooks and some line, a supply of quen of quinine in case they got malaria, and a metal tin full of matches. The fish hooks, at least, might prove useful if they could find bait. All they had for food, however, were four oranges and a handful of chocolate bars. The chocolate had been in Alex's pocket when he took a dip in the ocean. The salt water had turned it into a vile green mush that no one was willing to touch. Rounding out their worldly possessions were the following items. Eight inflatable life vests, two sheath knives, a pen knife, a pair of pliers, 18 flares, and a very pistol to fire them. Two 45 caliber 
caliber pistols and some ammunition, three sets of aluminum oars, two collapsible rubber, rubber bailing buckets, two hand pumps, and three patch kits to keep the rafts inflated, a few pencils, and finally, a pocket compass and a map of the Pacific. For the next few hours, a steady banter made its way across the waves. The men debated where in the world they might be, how close to the nearest land, how far from Japanese lines. Their seating arrangements were good for a few laughs. The large rafts were supposedly made to fit five people. But average-sized humans? Whoever made the puny things had scanned the army out of a good sum of money. The two large rafts measured four feet by seven feet on the outside. Inside the inflatable side walls, there was barely enough room for one man to lie lengthwise. Three men could wedge themselves in with an architecture so elaborate it was hard to tell which limbs belonged to whom. The smaller raft produced even more amusement. They called it the donut, and that's how it seemed. Alex and DeAngelis made themselves at home by sitting face to face and threading their legs over and under each other's arms. As the sun sank toward the horizon, the men shifted and squirmed and got ready for a night at sea. Rickenbacker suggested they keep watch in two-hour shifts. To keep spirits up, he offered $100 to the first man who spotted a ship, a plane, or an island. The sun disappeared in the west, and a three-quarter moon rose in its place. The sharks vanished in the half-light, but they were still out there, silent, vigilant. One by one, the men fell silent, too. To Rickenbacker, there was something about the vast darkness that made all conversation lose its meaning. At some point, Cherry loaded a flare in the very pistol, aimed at the heavens, and fired. For a moment, a bright crimson light outshone the moon and the stars. Then it was gone, and no light from a rescue plane appeared to replace it. The night seemed even darker than it had before.